Good morning, everyone. It is our great honor to invite Dr. Bing Yu from UC Berkeley to speak for us in this winter webinar series in 2021. So Dr. Yu is a very well-known statistician. She is the Chancellor's Professor in the Department of Statistics and Electrical Engineering Computer Science at UC Berkeley. Her work leverages computational developments to solve scientific problems by combining statistical machine learning approaches with the domain expertise of many collaborators, spanning many fields, including statistics, machine learning, neuroscience, genomics, and remote sensing. Her recent work has focused on solidifying a vision for data science, including a framework for veridical data science and the framework for interpretable machine learning. Dr. Yu has received re recent news coverage regarding her veridical data science framework investigation into the theoretical foundations of deep learning and world forecasting COVID-19 severity in the United States. Dr. Yu is a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the IEEE, the American Statistical Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences. And in 2012, she was the Tukey Lecturer of the Bernoulli Society for Mathematical Statistics and Probability. In 2018, she was awarded the Elizabeth L. Scott Award, and she was invited to give the Bryman Lecture at NERPS 2019 on the topic of veridical data science. So we are very honored to have Dr. Ding Yu to speak for us about this framework today. Thank you, Jessica, for inviting me for a very kind introduction. So what I want to do today is really share this framework. Uh, myself and my group have developed for vertical data science. If you haven't heard the term vertical, it means truthful. Actually, um, Professor Tian Zheng from um, uh, Columbia suggested the term. And my paper used to cover three principles of data science. And then I'll go uh, into this particular case study uh, using PCS and PCS uh, inference to detect epistasis um, with um, UK Biobank data. So as I said, vertical means truthful or coinciding with reality. And a lot of the recent problems my group has been working on are um, biomedical and with uh, collaborators. We really work very closely with collaborators and my students usually spend time with the collaborator and the collab basically like the co-advisors. And there are many problems. And overall, there's a lot of discussion in the media about AI. And I like this quote from Bill Gates saying that AI is like nuclear in energy, both promising and dangerous. And if you look around, many things we do have this impact of AI. Of course, under the hood is statistics, machine learning and data science. Data science is really a key element to AI, right? It has three important components, computer science, math stats, and domain knowledge. A particular very active area is machine learning, which sits at the boundary of computer science and statistics. And the domain um, emphasis has been always there for um, applied statistics. So in some sense, I feel like data science is really just applied statistics, but data science, I think it's a cooler name. To precisely define vertical data science, we like to say that it's really the data science extracts reliable and reproducible information from data. And I want to emphasize that we need to develop enriched technical language to describe and communicate the complexity in data and in models and in domain science to communicate and evaluate. And the emphasis is also empirical evidence, which should be at the most important like foundation for us to really behind any uh, impactful work. We can do theory and think, but we need to seek well validated empirical evidence in the context of human decision domain knowledge. And the goal of reversibility science really realize the promises and mitigates dangers of AI. To really think about do reversible data science, we have to take the view of data science as a system that people at the center Right. Without people, we don't have data science. And it's from domain question, data collection or choice. And we have a lot of public repositories now, especially in genomics. You make the choice which data you use or which lab you work with. And data cleaning, which is underappreciated, under discussed. 
and the typical EDA. And we spend a lot of time on modeling uh, algorithms, which is very, very important. But if the other parts are not trustworthy, I don't think modeling can save the day. So, and this is really an, not a linear um, process. Often you are doing the modeling and realize your data was not cleaned you know, in the right way, or you have different ways to clean the data. So you have to go back and um, uh, re-evaluate whether you clean the data in the right way. Oh, there's no right way. So maybe you should do two different ways and then see whether you get this consistent result. What we want to recognize in this uh, vertical data science framework is that we make so many judgment calls. We all know that there, if you take, say we have, I saw about 50, 60 of us, and we are giving the same problem, even the same collaborators, do we reach the same conclusions? And if we don't, I think it's very disconcerting. So vertical data science really tried to get us to do the quality control and standardization of the process that the result will be more reliable and reproducible and uh, transparent. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to introduce the PCS framework to all the goal of vertical data science. I hope the people here will join me to really uh, push for vertical data science. And you might have your own uh, take on things. And we have a particular way of doing vertical data science at this moment. And then the case study of IP tree for IP static interaction. So what's the PCS framework for vertical data science? So this is a paper I published PNS earlier this year with my uh, former student, now post at UCS, Carl Combeer. And we really tried to uh, unify and expand on Leo Brahman's two cultures, take useful and best practices from both machine learning and statistics, predictability as a universal check of models or reality check and computability very much put to the center by machine learning and expands on statistical inference to a stability principle for the whole data science life cycle. And you know, there's this nice trade drawing by um, my uh, current postdoc, Rebecca, that really described the importance of the three components, stability, which you root us, and computability, and so we get the fruits like uh, predictability and both as a result and also a model checking. And PCS also connects science with engineering. For me, data science, both a uh, subject in field in engineering and also in science. Both predictability and stability reflect two very important scientific principles, prediction and replication, right? Prediction, you know, proponents as philosophy of science uses prediction for falsifying theories. So that's what we can do, we can falsify models using prediction. And replication lab to lab but I generalize it to the whole data science life cycle and computability is very much at the center of machine learning, but we expand computability in the PCS framework to include data inspired simulations. I think simulations are underutilized in data science, and, but we need very uh, well developed uh, simulation setup so that the conclusion can argument what we see in real data. So it's both about scalability and convergence, but also about design of um, data inspired simulations. So stability is kind of in a way is the, at the very core of PCS. I started kind of embarking on this journey of um, advocating stability as a general principle with a paper, as Jessica mentioned, I was giving two key lecture in 2012 and was really trying to connect what I saw as instability of uh, Lasso model selection for interpretation with robust statistics and realize that we face both forms of perturbations in our line of work. What data perturbation you do, you do bootstrap, you do subsampling, you do cross validation, they don't give you exactly the same result. And also the model class you choose, you do the SUFO to say which genes are important for which cancer or use random forest. So therefore united both data and model perturbation in the modern stage and put it under the principle of st stability. And of course, central limit theorem, the, the, the core uh, mathematical result for classical statistics is very much a stability result, right? You know, if you look at concentration, all of that, it's really, you need stability conditions and therefore you get concentration. So it's very much not just at the common sense 
heart of statistics, but it's also at the mathematical foundation of statistics. It's really about stability. And it's a minimum requirement for interoperability, reproducibility. That's why I first write a 2013 paper, but now we actually evolved into as a principle with a predictability for scientific hypothesis generation or intervention design. And this is just uh, called the paper 2013 is that reproducibility is imperative for any scientific discovery. More often than not, modern scientific findings rely on statistical analysis of high dimensional data. At a minimum, reproducibility itself uh, manifests itself in stability of statistical results relative to reasonable perturbation to data and to the model used. I will, I will discuss what do we mean by reasonable. Any questions at this point? No? No, there's no question. So going back to the data science life cycle, I want to emphasize that stability without predictability, it's not very interesting. Constant, zero is very stable, right? Nobody really doing study about zero right now. So it's really, you want to do model check and then you ask for stability. Stability is like you have a system which reflect reality and you try to shake every part, usually induced by judgment calls so that the system doesn't break. And the PCS workflow is really try to embed the three principles in every step of the data science life cycle. So in domain question stage, P really means thinking about the future. Right. You're not formulating a problem, so you only care about the data in hand. You're really thinking about a future patient, um, a future experiment. So it's always about what's going to come. So P kind of is a in for future and the external studies or external population you really care about. And you can think about all the three uh, principles in every step. And we also develop a generalization of statistical inference, we call PCS inference, which would specialized to statistical inference, you have a very well developed probability model and your data indeed is a realization from this random generating process like in randomized trials. Then you don't have to worry about data cleaning, then it goes back to statistical inference in the traditional sense. But even any clinical trials, actually you do have data cleaning problems. So you never really, we don't have never in a situation that statistical inference is adequate. So PCS inference intend to expand that to take into account a lot of other perturbation to the process than just sample to sample variability. So data perturbation, especially in the IID case, we have different form, but seldom each researcher would do uh, bootstrap or subsampling. You don't get exactly the same results. And you might even add noise to data, which Leo Bryman was quite fond of. And you can do bootstrap, you fit the model and look at the kind of um, residuals and then um, you know, bootstrap in mixed effect models already have several different versions, right? So all of that, do we get the same results? And in the PCS framework, we want to include, one goal actually when I started this was really try to be able to uh, unify the approaches to data by uh, mathematical st uh, applied statistics like mathematicians, like PDE people. They also talk about uncertainty quantification to be able to unify all of that under the same umbrella. So synthetic data from mecha mechanistic PDEs can be viewed as one form of data perturbation. And we also have data modality choices now. It's not really easily viewed under a probability framework. Do you use text data or you use video data? Uh, PIAC is an international organization that uh, evaluate the workers' competency. You know, they send workers to different countries and interview them. Sometimes you use audio, sometimes you use video. And you can also connect with um, causality um, like investigations through invariance, which is a principle that goes back to the faulties by uh, people in economics. And differential privacy now actually, a US census will be done through, it's a form of stability. And the most recent eye-catching coverage of deep learning is about adversary attacks that if you use deep learning to do medical diagnosis, you can attack the system and you get completely opposite a diagnosis. So if you connect with the model perturbation, then we already have robust statistics and we have different modes in non-convex optimization. And in practice, people sometimes use lasso, something is rich and you have different kernels, you have sensitivity. So there are many, many things that we want to make it transparent and the most Pronounce is actually research to research perturbation, right? For climate models, 
we have nine leading teams. You often see plots like that about the global temperature prediction that you don't have the same, you have an interval. So to kind of summarize what I've been saying that I want, I believe we need to bring the human judgment call to the upfront of the statistical um, data science analysis that so we can vet this judgment calls, at least do perturbation so that the results are not artifacts of the judgment calls. Of course, these judgment calls we all make and usually we don't write about them. Therefore, this really suggests that we need to have a systematic documentation that go with any published paper, any report and put on GitHub for yourself and for other people to help you to review. So reality is independent of the symbols in codes and in mathematical work. Why are they related? There's no obvious reason when you write down a statistical model, there's a reality correspondence. Our education and the way we have been doing statistics in the last few decades, we really don't emphasize enough this reality connection between the symbols to reality. So is there a connection? It's our job to really make the connections through quantitative and qualitative narratives and through a documentation like a Jupyter Notebook or R Markdown and to document the judgment call so that you remember why you did this way or other people can see how you make your judgment call that become part of the evidence uh, for people to evaluate the conclusions. Otherwise, we're really not on a very solid foundation. There's no magic is that can we document at least be transparent and you you'll be more rigorous if you're more transparent it's just human nature and other people will help you to be more uh, rigorous as well people ask me like how do you choose perturbations in pch right i have at least like eight or ten steps if every step there are two different possibilities you go to, to the power of ten that's a lot so um there are two ways you can kind of manage the problem of uh, doing stability analysis, computation costs, you might be limited. So at least you can do a marginal perturbation. You can, for each possibility, you make a linear, you do two possible choices and fix the other parts. Or you do a random combination of all the possible choices. But if you pledge to stability principle, that it will help you to think very carefully because usually we want to have something, but we want to find something that's um, really legitimate, not you know, kind of artifacts of our uh, analysis. And if you pledge the stability principle, if you try too many perturbations, you might end up with nothing. So you want to be very careful about to admit what perturbation. You want to do it because otherwise you worry about things not you know, consistent when you change things, but you also want to be thinking hard, say, don't do unnecessary perturbation that doesn't work for the situation. And the documentation, basically, you make the argument uh, why you did certain perturbations. Sometimes it can be just you have limited computation. That's the only thing you can do. But at least we should do, I would say, two, right, instead of just doing one, uh, whatever you report in the paper. And cherry picking is kind of the opposite. You maybe end up writing 100 models. You only report the best one. That usually doesn't hold that when you have external data. And uh, so uh, if you don't like to have non result you, can, you should choose very carefully your perturbations, but you should still try to do perturbation because otherwise it could be the artifact of your uh, human judgment calls. And the paper also want to expand on a statistical inference. So our goal is really taking the view that we really don't have the power and uh, the belief that we can say p-value less than something, we find the truth. I definitely don't believe that. We're really part of the decision-making and we try to provide data evidence in the best way we can to help make decisions. So um, we have to retreat from like actually p-value, just make the case and that's it. And if we take a look at a very critical examination of our uh, statistical inference, it really rests on this um, probabilistic, like um, I would say, um, framing without, if we cannot interpret what it means by a probability statement, I don't think p-value makes a sense. So p-value had a lot to do with, we see data as random realizations of some random process. 
And that's actually already an assumption. If you already, if you only care about the data in hand, you don't need random variable. You, at least you can have to imagine another realization of the same random process in a different physical condition or by a different lab. Random variable kind of tie them together. They become two realizations. Otherwise, you don't need random variable. You only care about data in hand. It's a descriptive. You don't need p-value, all of that. So recognizing even introduce the concept of random variable in data-driven problems, you're making assumption. Of course, in randomized trial, you actually explicitly introduce randomization and you have less of a problem because you, you randomizing, but of course that's a pseudo randomness. So you're already imp implicit assume there are two physical situations that they can produce two realization of same random value. It's kind of like a stability assumption. If you cannot really do a thought experiment to imagine that. And what do we mean by probability as statements? And that's fundamentally questionable. And most of the statistical theory are done under the model structure being correct. And we try to see linear model and you know and the parameter estimation under a correctly specified structure model. But in practice, it's never the case. So our p-value, which is derived under the correct model structure, open measure model bias, which the theory doesn't deal with. So we can deal with it, I think, through simulated models. But I would like to think, oh, our journal publications should really include when the, your method will go wrong because everything, nothing works all the time. That's, I think, the first theorem in statistics. So we should really put it out there. It's like, we have these algorithms they are standalone product on the internet, our website, on GitHub. Other people can use it. It's a product for massive consumption. But we don't have any warning sign like drugs or anything to say, hey, this situation, don't use my algorithms. And this is problematic. And a lot of the p-value calculations, if the model assumptions not checked, they're not really providing evidence. And personally, I think we should move away from the use of true model because nothing is exactly true and to talk about approximate postulated models. In terms of education, I think it just conceptually, we create difficult for ourselves when we use true model and students usually just think, yeah, everything they write down is true. And we don't say that we have to justify. So if you use postulated, that just cognitively students will recognize that, yeah, it's postulated, it might not be true. So I think we should really move away from the use of true model. Uh, in theoretical analysis, we should also use assumed model. Just, just try not to blur the boundary between reality and the mathematics we do. Mathematics can be super powerful if it's relevant, but otherwise it's not relevant to practice. So the PTS inference, is yes. Professor, for the interaction, there's a question in the chat box from Aaron sure. Lucy. The question is, where does causal inference method, such as graphical causal models, et cetera, fit into the PCS framework described here? The, I think causal inference model in general, I find it very hard to interpret in practice. And you're welcome to go there with these principles. We're doing some basic PCS inference. So there, I feel like even you don't go to graphical model, you just even take the Navy and Ruby approach. A lot of the assumptions similar for the graphical models, you need to do some perturbation to check because we basically in causal inference, unless you have randomization, you basically assume causality, you try to estimate the effect. And that I think I would like to think we can do some perturbations you still don't prove causality, but that's what we do in our practice. We combine predictability and stability as a recommendation system, but we still want the wet lab experiment to prove the real causality, but you can reduce the design space much more by introducing stability on top of uh, uh, predictability. So that's what we have been doing it. And I think mean, you know, we're having a post with colleagues from MIT who people there in economic do synthetic control, but um, it's, it's, I kind of like the high level idea, but the particular way they do it, I think can be improved. It's you use data to kind of create some scenarios and then maybe we can 
use that synthetic environment and get a little more evidence. You can never prove causality that way, but you can maybe accumulate more evidence towards causality. So thanks, it's a very good question that we have been, I call scientific recommendation system. We basically work with the lab and they prove causality but will help them to reduce the um, design space with uh, perturbations and these multiple models. So we have a paper from NERP last year. Uh, it's basically using this to help um, Mayo Clinic people to find the targets for uh, different cancers for existing cancer drugs. And we didn't really improve predictability, but we uh, really use stability and find more uh, interpretable results. Thank you for the question. So back to PCS inference, we introduced basically this thing got really, really taken by machine learning, right? It's prediction error. Even cr cross validation prediction error is still better than not doing it for model checking. So without that, I don't think we should go for p-value because when the p when the model doesn't fit the data at all, we really don't know what p-value you know, measures. And that's measuring model error and it's a projection and we just really don't have any backing why that means anything. So we have to do some basic model checking before we go to the finer level of p-value calculation because all p-value calculation, most of them assuming that the model is correct or more or less correct. And uh, the S is taken care of by data model perturbations and we um, both predictability and stability require a lot of computation. But this is really try to say that it's very algorithmic. We're just saying this is what we do algorithmically. And you, if you want to go to the probabilistic kind of interpretation, you have to write a very well you know, you know, written document to back it up. Why this type of algorithm perturbations correspond to some random process in what sense and toward reality. So kind of try to take apart the operational like algorithm thing we do, which to the more interpretation that, oh, it's actually p-value under the property is so small, but what do you mean by the property is so small? What's the sample space? What are the other possibilities? That question needs to be answered before we can talk about p-value. So the PCI inference is really taking the prediction as to its heart and to do screening, I always split data into training and test and deal with post-selection inference uh, concerns through the sample split. And after the models pass the, pre the screening, could be actually you set part of the training data as validation to do the screening. And then you just consider all the models that pass the screening and also um, the data perturbations that you want to entertain. And you have created a distribution of um, target values under these different perturbations and you summarize through uh, perturbation intervals. So everything's completely kosher. You don't have data cleaning problem, which I've never seen in today's uh, data analysis. You go back to the classical statistics and you, don't, you have the right model structure and you're not struggling between the Sioux versus random forest or different versions of mixed effect models, then you go back to the classical statistics. So this is you know, what we do already. We just choose, oh, we are not accustomed to reporting all the things we actually do when we do the formal analysis. So let me just illustrate the PCS thinking uh, in the uh, recent study. So I'm a co-PI or I'm a PI on this team of uh, researchers from three institutions, UCSF, Stanford, and Berkeley with cardiologists and data scientists, mostly from Berkeley, my colleague, Ben Brown, and uh, with many uh, wonderful postdocs and students to really um, have this uh, inter-campus uh, team to do uh, cardiovascular health. And the first project we took on is really try to detect epistatic interactions. We have something we call IP tree. The paper just uh, put on the archive. So for, I don't know how many of you, I, you know, heard you probably most, a lot of you are in biology know that epistasis um, means a nonlinear interaction. You don't have additive, you know, um, relationship. And a classic example is the Drosophila's eyes. When you have brown and scallop, and when you have the second generation of uh, crossing, then you end up with something white. So there's something nonlinear happening. It's not like you're just having 
the, the different degrees additive adding up something quite nonlinear happened, which you have white uh, fruit flies with white eyes. Mathematically, uh, people have been traditionally formulating this uh, IPCC discovery through a simple logistic um, regression problem with additive terms and multiplicative terms. And if you look into the literature, it's really, there's no reason except like seems that's what we have done and why you have to go this route. And there's a mathematical theorem saying that for any function, if you find the right scaling, you can always write it as an additive. So that means if you don't decide on the scaling, everything is additive, not, nothing is epistatic. And if you take main effect and then polynomial interaction in second order, third order, you write into exponential explosion of interaction terms. And many biological um, entities actually don't have main effect, but when they interact, they have strong effect. And so you don't have to do this always main first and first order, second order interaction, third and so forth. So we decided to take a positive control to kind of um, wet our pipeline instead of going for cardiovascular disease right away because that's you know a lot more complex. So we had access to UK buyback data and something has been studied quite a bit is the red hair phenotype that self-reported. And uh, because there are past work done, so we, like we can kind of um, uh, compare with our approach versus what people have discovered and to relatively, it's this human trait. So therefore it's complex, but it's, it's far less complex than um, uh, cardiovascular phenotypes. So um, the first thing we have, the data, as I said, right, we, we have um, half a million individuals and we end up having about 15,000 people self-identify as red hair and we just randomly selected the same amount, a number of controls from the database. And you have 10 million uh, SNP, so variants uh, kind of uh, imputed from 8,000. 800,000 observed uh, SNPs. The first thing is try to do dimensionality in a biologically inspired way. We use predict scan, other people develop and impute the gene expression about 10,000. And we impute the gene expression. And then we I'll introduce something some of you might have heard called E2 random forest to do the dimensionality reduction based on gene expression, and we search for uh, the gene interactions using the combination found by Ituri and the forest. We also use the genes and map back to variants and also do the same analysis at the SNP level. Okay, so it's a two-step procedure. So we use positive control. And um, as I said, we've got 30,000 subjects, half um, red hair, half not. And then we split, random split, stratify. So make sure that um, you have both control, um, 2,000 cases and 2,000 control for both the training and test data. And the rest we put into the training. So we used the um, predict scan to go to the gene level, which you have fewer genes, and to do, that's one biologically inspired data reduction. And then we, at the gene level, we also uh, use something called e 2 random forest. My group and Ben's group developed, and we selected 18 order two or higher order interaction candidates. I will, I will tell you next what do I mean by e 2 random forest. And then for the interaction found through interactive forest, then we look at um, we develop uh, epistasis model based on decision tree and PCSP value to decide whether there's an interaction or not. So let's take a step back to look at our e random forest. So this is really um, building on the knowledge of the community that uh, e random forests have been working pretty well in terms of prediction. And then this um, decision tree mathematical form really reflect many biological processes, uh, thresholding behavior. You need abundance of biomolecules to be high before they interact because there's a lot of randomness in the cell. But the problem is it's very hard to interpret random forest. When you change the data, remember what I said at the beginning, that then the trees change. It's an old idea 
not from us in the literature that people tend to think if two genes fell on the same path, they probably interact. This is a mathematical interaction, but we think it's biological interacting. So this is a leap of faith to translate a mathematical kind of procedure into a more biological physical form. But that's happening in the literature. But if you look at which genes fell on the same path in a decision tree in random forest, they are very unstable. So we want to introduce stability. So we used an uh, importance index from random forest, which we're also looking, maybe we can improve that. And to, to now the next step, we sample based on the important index. And we use this method called random intersection chair, Sharon Mannhausen, to quickly find intersection path. And then we have an after loop of backing. So what we did, you start with uh, feature weights uniform as in random forest. And then we have important measures and we reweigh. So the whole pipeline is the same as random forest. And now we have, we grow the tree like this, right? We basically concentrate on fewer uh, uh, features, but we never delete anything. So it's a soft dimensionality reduction. And then we collect all the different paths in a very computation efficient way through random intersection tree. They divide for binary uh, vectors. So you have two classes of binary vectors and you want to see what are the shared ones for the two classes. So we turn this problem each path turns into a binary vector because if a gene gets split, it becomes one. If not, gets zero. There's more sophisticated versions of this about positive and negative, but let me tell you the vanilla version. And then it becomes a problem can be dealt with by random intersection trees. And you can quickly look at intersections and find the common um, um, like uh, genes on the same path. And then we have an after loop and we have st stability score look at the uh, after loop. So iterative random forest is actually uh, one of the motivating examples or case studies for, uh, for us to develop PCS uh, framework because you have random forests which have good predictive performance and we solve the computation problems through random intersection trees and we add a lot of stability. So if you look at the performance, uh, people use Lasso to do this problem as I said, right, the red hair. And for test holdout data, you can see that the uh, AUC, so you, we have three fall curves. The green one is the iterative random forest at the gene level. And that's with the SNP. The red, the second best, is iterative random forest with gene uh, at the gene level. And then the lasso is the blue, which is worse for both. And it's interesting that ranger, which is random forest, gives the worst. So the lesson here is that when you add stability, Sometimes you actually also add improved prediction accuracy if the original method doesn't have enough regularization stability. Previous experience is actually, we don't lose a predictive accuracy for the, the Drosophila data work on in the original paper RF, but here you actually see improved performance because whatever random forest, the, the regularization and uh, stability built in is not enough for this data and you need more. So that's, um, it's not like there's always a, a, it can also be not a trade-off, but improvement. And then James, who is really the leading senior also on this a cardiologist at Stanford now uh, moved you know, to uh, another uh, place that uh, he look at the goal terms and see that, you know, actually we find many, many genetic determinants of red hair, like hair color or pigmentation. And then look at also into the protein, protein interactions we find that also seem to me, this is all, um, pretty um, like a subjective. So for in terms of interacting with a subject uh, experts, uh, my group for another project, we developed something we called uh, expert opinion solicitation with a false, with negative controls. What do we mean that actually we actually also give them some fake interactions come from some perturbed but not right result to see whether they can tell them apart. Of course, you give them some really uh, uh, garbage, they can easily tell. So it's basically become a testing problem. You want the expert to be able to tell them apart. So what they tell you is actually real information instead of they just want to be nice to you, confirmation bias and, and um, agree with you. So we, call, we have a name for it now called the expert opinion solicitation with uh, negative controls. 
So back to the epistasis, right? So we now reduce the dimensionality to random forest. Now we talk about the gene level. As I said, you have to decide on the scale. And the penetrance is called the probability of being red hair giving two genes. And the gene interaction already discovered by e 2 random forest. So this is already in the training data. And then you can take the logistic regression approach, which is the traditional approach, or you can take uh, the decision tree is also a form of nonlinear, very integral interaction, actually more integral than the multiplicative. And then you can also just take a random forest. It's not very integral, but it's still some nonlinear form. So we decided to take the penetrance because there seems no good reason to go for low jet transform. We use the penetrance and we decide to introduce um, the decision tree as interaction. So the card model actually also fit beta for our gene, uh, imputed gene expression data. So here you see on the right-hand side is the smoothed probability. So we choose two um, uh, genes, ACIP and tube three. And what you see is some average uh, smooth proportion of red hair. And you see the stripes because this imputation through predict scan is done by some versions of Lasso, And the SNP data is discrete. So even you have a continuous linear combination, you still see the discreteness coming up. And the cart on the left hand side, you have four plots. And the top two plots give you linear gene gene interaction, it's all penetrant scale. And the other one is with plus the multiplicative. And the downstairs, you have the left, which is the cart, just adding, you fit cart A and cart B, and you put them together. And the epistates, you put them together, you naturally have a, a nonlinear interaction. So this is really showing that we can see also through prediction, just this visually that the card based model fit the data better. So this is uh, similarly just give you in a graph that uh, you can fit A with the data training data and you fit card decision to B. So this is very interpretable saying that this gene level less than something you more likely to be, if it's low, then you're more likely not to be a red hair. Otherwise, you're more likely to be a red hair. And you can do the same using the second gene, def8. Oh, you can fit them together. You see the interaction now. So the first cut is use def8, and then depends on SF is less than something or def, you, you end up with different uh, uh, like branches and different conclusions. So all of that is done by the training data. You have chosen the, the interaction terms and you have find the CART forms using training data and the epistasis. You go in to the test data with very form two hypothesis, right? And this is what you see is the uh, prediction error. Remember PCS use prediction as screening. So you look at the top line, you see a black bar, which is the epistasis model and the length of the bar is the prediction error on the test. And the black line cross is the prediction error if you use all the genes selected by iterative random forest. Now you're only doing two, of course, the prediction line, you do, you do worse. But if you compare the two models, if the black bar is less than the orange bar, that's the prediction screening. Then we're gonna do the, PCS p-value calculation. Otherwise you're done, p-value is one. So if the non-model does better than the epistasis model, then you don't want to get it. You know, you're basically saying that I go for the non-model. So that's why you see many, the bars got dropped is because the non-model actually does better in terms of prediction and epistasis model. So we're not gonna do p-value. We just say p-value is one. For the ones past the screening, you go on to calculate the PCS p-values, right? So you can see, I'll tell you next how we did the PCS p-value. We take a minus log 10 of that. That's the bar remaining. So the PC value calculation, uh, as I said, is after screening and high level, we are getting more reasonable p-values than the very small ones. Even you just chi-square because chi-square views on this analytical approximation, which really on the tail doesn't really hold, right? We don't, we, we never really should observe something as small as 10 to the minus 11. 
because the analytical approximation, we don't have basis to go that far when you have such a big data. And um, the details, we actually introduce more variability in the calculation p-values. What we do is that, remember, we go in with two fixed models based on the training data already. But since the test data is kind of a random subset, we want to take into account in the test data that's not, it could be another other possibility for test data. So we build that uh, variability into the calculation. What we do is that you go in using the gene level to predict the probabilities and use Bernoulli um, because the penetrance scale to simulate, use the non-model, the non-distribution data. And then you bootstrap from the test data to find the same size. And you look at this test statistic, which is some likelihood ratio, which one's bigger? And you average all these different bootstrap samples. So in the end, you see that PC value for this case is more conservative because we got smaller p-values. And in a simple linear regression model, we can do some calculation and show that what we end up doing with this algorithm procedure, you can do the analysis that is actually, we're really testing a fattened non-hypothesis. Remember, I go in with a very precise hypothesis. It's a Bernoulli model with a very precise probability depends on the cart, whatever fitted on the tray. So it's a very precise one distribution. But this resample the test data for the alternative, you really fattening, you basically adding robustness to the testing procedure. And therefore we uh, get smaller p-value. So we, we have a project try to do it for the more general case. And back, right, James also looked at again to say that actually all the genes we discovered relate to very famous genes, MC1R. Actually, there's an article, there's a journal, a magazine for red hair people under the name MC1R and as a Wensong chromosome 16, Wensong chromosome 20. We find a lot of genes uh, very close to these genes. And we also find new, uh, dis new discoveries that this is one way developed by my group called a superheat. It's a way to look at high dimensional data. And you can see if you plot some uh, kind of importance measures of these interactions and the right hand side is the superheat map and you have red hair, you can see there's subgroups among the red hair people, right? Some, you have these bars that all the first group, subgroup of red hair, all the interactions seem to be active. And then the middle one, there's only one interaction which is and DB, NDD1, and UPF3A to be active. And then the last one, you have other interactions active. So this is a way to see, to interpret what we find. And so to summarize, we developed this epitree pipeline, including a particular epitree test, which you don't have to do the pipeline. If you're giving two genes, your collaborator give you, you can already do this. You don't need all the screening part. So that's what we call epitree test and epitree pipeline that um, then we use e 2 random forage on top of the uh, predict scan to reduce uh, dimensionality. And then we can do everything at the SNP level. So it's not just for order two interaction. We, we can also do the similar thing for three order, false order interactions. So we do find three, uh, three other interaction if you look at here, right? We have a couple of three way interactions and some of the genes are actually and new people haven't reported. But this is, again, I would think as a recommendation system, it's not proven. Even the p-value is, you know, our PCS p-value is small. So to summarize, um, we really hope that uh, more people will um, start using the term vertical data science for trustworthy AI. And PCS is one approach we established uh, in my group and collaborators. It took really 10 years and documentation is really a big part of this framework. And we had two case, four case studies to motivate um, the framework, but we have done four more since the time. So we have, I'm a lot more um, convinced that this is a good framework. I hope uh, you guys check it out. That I usually, you know, the things we develop, I play a lot of role, try to take it apart. And if we cannot take it apart, I have more confidence in what we do. And uh, recently there's a paper with uh, writing with uh, ER doctors uh, from San Francisco, UCSF and other places to stress test, 
clinical decisions. So this is for when to send the kid with a, a abdominal trauma injury to a CT scan. And this established decision rules and we actually stress test it and they hold up pretty well. So publishing is the original uh, developers of the original decision rule. So PCS is useful for us to develop new measures and new pipelines, but it's also useful for evaluating existing test uh, pipeline. There was a startup, uh, the founder reached out to me in New York. They do um, like a data science consultancy and they use PCS ideas in you know, vetting um, their clients a data science life cycle or pipeline. So I shall emphasize that domain knowledge is extremely important. PCS is a conceptual framework. There's still many components. You have to still have to make judgment calls and hopefully you have good domain knowledge to do that and documentation. And this framework generate hypothesis that can be tested either through external validation or another. So stat a uh, disk is one thing we did for subgroup discovery with clinical trial data and we have external study really happened to be um, there for this painkiller called we all uh, we all vax that um, really hold up pretty well and deep tunes for neuroscience ESCV is for the zoo RF already talked stat NF is for non-negative matrix factorization to choose the number of components and stat this is the clinical trial for subgroup discovery and that drip is really this cancer uh, drug discovery uh, from different tissue lines. So back to the heart problem, cardiovascular health. We're now working with uh, the Ashley team from Stanford and the UK Biobank data, we're still making, try to make progress, but we're also looking at more or quantitative traits, not just a disease or not. And uh, there's a group of people at Stanford work on trying to extract use deep learning from uh, MRI uh, videos, uh, different uh, quantitative treats. And it's much, much more challenging, but uh, we're hopeful that we'll get somewhere too. And, but we probably have to develop, further develop the epitry uh, pipeline to get reliable results. So I'd like to thank my uh, group. So we really concentrate on focus on solving problems um, I'm part of Biohub, but also NeuroHub. We're starting on Alzheimer's disease with some pretty cool uh, nano uh, scale imaging. We're putting two different groups of collaborators together, and we're kind of returning to theory of deep learning and also random forest. We put we just put out the first paper looking at uh, model selection properties of uh, random forest. Of course, you have to assume a Boolean model to you know this this interaction to discover. So, um, and the PCS framework is being put into a textbook, which uh, we have a contract with MIT Press. We'll have a free online copy and we're in the middle of trying to finish this spring. And um, it's really trying to cover the whole data science and pipeline, a lot about the connection from reality. We emphasize that part. We have some math, but there are a lot of great math books related to machine learning statistics. So we don't lay, belabor on that. But it's more about the um, judgment calls and a um, lot of the practical things don't usually get covered by uh, textbooks, which you have to face when you do a real problem. This is based on a class I teach at Berkeley 215A for the last 11 years. So that kind of evolved into this book and uh, Rebecca is my former student, my current postdoc co-author of the book. Thank you. So here are the papers. Uh Hope you check out PCS and thanks. Um, and feel free to email me for questions. I really hope to get more people uh, you know, to develop this uh, together further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, for your talk. So we have some questions in the chat box. So one question from Anubu, Anubav is that, I agree with including warnings about where models can fail. Unfortunately, I don't see that done in many journals and sometimes it seems like the results shown are cherry picked. Are there any journals which also require authors to include cases which models, where models they use or design fail? I'm not aware. I've been trying to tell my friends who become chief editors about that. I don't know how far I have gone with that. But I think there are two issues here. One is to publish your paper. The other thing is whether you can sleep at night. 
So I think both are important, especially a lot of what we do will be used by precision medicine, right? So there's general professional responsibility. We have to push a little to our, you know, more reliability and more transparency. Just because you and I, all of us might be treated by some AI algorithms. I joke about I can be killed by my own algorithm, right? Somebody grab my algorithm and use it not properly. And, and then, so I think, and then eventually when enough of us won't do this and then the journal will follow. I think we need both. The journals, I mean, any opportunity I have, I will advocate, but a lot is also, we vote with our feet, right? We'll all start doing it. You know, you don't want to put it in paper, you can put it on the GitHub, right? So there's a lot of public repository now we can share information that it's more like whether a group of us want to do this together. It's, I agree that it's very hard for one person to do, but at least I have no problem attracting students in Berkeley. So that's already say something young people care about these issues. And I recently just have a CS student who reached out to me and said, you know, I heard your PCS talk, I want to do a project with you. So, so I think we should believe that slowly things will happen and maybe you can try this out for one of your papers. It will take longer, there's no doubt. But maybe you actually feel better. You are more confident about the result. So that's a lot of positives already. Something which would, would pass the test of time. I think a lot of the quality work is really going to have a higher chance to pass the test of time. Thank and, you very much for the answer. Yeah, I definitely with students in my class, you know, a lot of young people really find this really interesting, make a lot of sense. Um, and I'm just bringing it to you for you to consider. Of course, you make your judgment call, but you know, give some thought to these issues or develop your own different ways of doing virtual data science. It's completely, yeah, we should have parallel approaches and compare. But this is pretty broad. So I think a lot of things can be kind of, um, this is really trying to unify a lot of things already. A lot of good groups already do this stability analysis, but not systematic, even in my own group, right? So this even for ourselves is helpful to be more systematic. Yeah, the second question is from Andrea Ziegler. I think he already left. So probably that I actually found out his email. Probably I can just email your answer to him afterwards. So the question is, can you please provide the reference for the statement that you can always find a linear relationship? I didn't say we can, I, I, when did I say, I don't think I said that. Uh, I don't recall myself. Yeah, I don't think, mm -hmm. probably it's a mis, miscommunication. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever said that you can always find a linear. I definitely don't believe that. <laughs> Sorry, I can intervene. I think he was talking about when you talked about interactions and that you can model, depending on the scale, you can change that scale to a linear scale. No, I didn't say linear. I think you can find a scale that things will be additive. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. I guess yeah, he, I didn't say linear. Um, it's additive. additive. Maybe yeah. I misspoke to say it's linear. No, I, what I meant to say, I don't know what I exactly said. Oh. You can also find the scale things are additive. So you call that additive linear, then that's, yeah. But that's a theorem, it's a mathematical theorem. Yeah, you can always find a transformation and something. You can write it things as additive, yeah. Can you provide a reference for that? I'm also interested in that. Yeah, I have to, it's in the paper. If you go to this paper, it's cited there. It's Arnold, I think, Kermel Grove and Arnold theorem. Yeah, if you go to our um, IP3 paper, it's cited there. If you don't find it, just email me. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, I think it's called Kermel Grove Arnold theorem, yeah. And related to that, Ben, so there's a, a private question I received asking whether you are willing to share your slides after the talk. Yeah, I can share my slides, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and there's a question from Joseph. How is the concept of stability related to sensitivity analysis? 
That's an excellent question. It's tend to be a generalization of, of the sensibility, sensitivity. So stability is a concept very much user defined. You define your perturbation and you assess your, your the, the stability relative to that perturbation. So if you take the um, sensitivity analysis in Bayesian statistics, people usually do some local perturbation the prior you choose. So that's the perturbation you decide to do. Right, but I want to be more general than just that particular perturbation within the Bayesian framework. I want to also look at the perturbation jumping from random forest importance measure to the Sioux importance measure. Because qualitative from scientific point of view, two different statistics could take two different approaches. I want to get the same results, right? Otherwise, which one do I trust? If you're a scientist, you know, have no particular love you know, pretty impartial about Lasso versus random forest. Oh, you say biologically random forest makes more sense. And then you document. So it's a generalized version of all oh, the sensitivity analysis and perturbations. And like dynamic system, there's stability analysis, right? They usually do perturbation of initial conditions, for example. And um, an adversary attack is a form, extreme form of perturbation. So all of this can be discussed under stability analysis, but user defined the perturbation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you, so you it, write, write something about it, why this is appropriate perturbation. Right. So I think the key is that the designing of a reasonable perturbation mechanism requires a lot of domain expertise in applications. Yes. And the reason yeah. I want to put that the documentation is like encourage us to think more clearly what we mean by when we put a random variable, what do we mean by when we do a perturbation. And what does that mean in practice in domain, right? So you, you come up with a narrative and describe that. I think that will clear our mind. And then yeah. when we talk about p-value, actually we know what it means. You yeah. see a lot of work now, people do perturbations and come up with a p-value. Actually, a lot of times it's hard to find with a non-hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you have very weak non-hypothesis, like a straw man, once I'm in a qualifying exam, actually a lot to do with why I need putting a prediction in this inference. The student was doing time series data in hydrology. And then he basically tests a non-hypothesis that things are IID. And this is obviously it's wrong because he had time series data, they lost deep end, but he's not really testing the particular time series model he's developing. Mm -hmm. And he just declared his method works because he tested IID doesn't hold. So, so I think how do you design the non-hypothesis is very, very important. And we don't discuss enough that yeah. uh, some are just very weak non-hypothesis, like testing your data is not IID. It doesn't learn anything about your particular time series model. Right. But you have a very, very small p-value. Yeah. So I think we also have you know, layers of different like non-hypothesis um, too. Exactly. And also a question, a related question I encounter myself is that sometimes people, the scientists, what they want to do is re they really want to accept the null hypothesis, it, not rejecting it. So in that case, they, they tend to use the hypothesis testing framework in a wrong way. They, te they, they tend to say, okay, not rejecting the null means I trust the null, but that's not what it should be like. Well, I think if we go back to the evidence seeking, a lot of things are easier to think about than quickly go to a particular like technique, the framing, mm -hmm. because when you talk about high level, maybe there are multiple ways. That's why this is stability at the problem formulation stage. We should yeah. also entertain that. You should talk about maybe you should reverse it, right? And right, this is right. arbitrary. And then you don't yeah. have the same conclusion. You see, that's the problem, right? Yeah, exactly. But if you quickly allow them to go to a very specific articulation of statistical formulation, then you kind of trapped. Mm -hmm. But that's why I think stability at the problem formulation level is also very important. As you said, right? You can reverse it mm -hmm. and formulate the other way. And scientifically, qualitatively, it shouldn't make a difference. Yeah. But why it does, you know, the question is why. And yeah, there's also linguistic ability, right? I have two teams of people talking. Do they mean the same thing when they use the term matrix, for example? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I mean, stability is really common sense. You know, I got quotes by Greek philosophers like Plato 
saying that you know knowledge has to be tied down or to be stable, but your opinions can change. But yeah, really going after knowledge then has to be stable. Yeah, I agree. And it's really a common sense principle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we are actually almost about the time. So before we conclude, then may I ask a last question about the three components in your PCS framework? What if you have contradiction in terms of like for comparing models? What if one model does better for predictability, one does better in stability? How would you weigh those three merits in your framework? Or do you think it's a, it like a solution? Right. So usually we take a cut on predictability, mm -hmm. right? And then we take interpret, say you have five models that pass yeah. the, the predictability test. Then you only interpret the part that's stable across all five different models. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to do it. Or you can take an average for some other purpose. So mm -hmm. it's flexible. That depends on the purpose. We have done both in different circumstances, but you use like do a screening. I think we definitely have to do some model checking, which we now just don't do any model checking anymore. And that's very disconcerting. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. And thank stability and predictability is kind of the same thing if you only care about prediction. Yeah. 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 Thank you then. Thank you very much for the insightful talk. I think we all learned a lot. And Thanks for having if you have, yeah, thank you. And if you have for the audience, if you have any further questions, please feel free to let us know and we, we can forward your questions to Ben afterwards. And Gina posted a link about the YouTube video recording link and the slides, which will be available shortly after today's talk. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everybody and for all the good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.